The Keys and Whiting Bay are just one small part of our parish. Five timber posts dug in a line into the sand, pointing safe passage for returning boats, because the rub of a rock can damage a boat or take a life. In the last two weeks we have telephoned and Zoom called some neighbours with knowledge of the Keys. In our conversations we connect the five timber posts with the families of Ardagina and Ardmore. We hear the Veals, Hennebrys, Mag Fitzgerald, Nora Mulcahy, the Gallagher's and the Welches of these parts. We meander through memory, place name and place. We see Ardagina today and look into its past. A key by definition is a long platform where boats can be tied up, loaded and unloaded. The keys in Whiting Bay aren't quite that, but what are they? John King highlights the role of the five poles as a navigation aid which perhaps best explains their unusual nature. Coastal erosion in Whiting Bay has had a big impact on the coastline. All of the sand we walk on today was land in the 1840s Arden survey map, except for that pocket we call the Keys. Sandstone and limestone bedrock meet here in Ardagina, and a gap in the rocks forms a straight line out to sea. Coming from one of the last families to use the Keys for commercial fishing purposes, we made a quick call to Shamey V. I remember a, a young lad going out to Whiten Bay with my dad there. He used to tie up the boat there all the time. He used to fish with his brother Henry. Oh, that would be, yeah, 70s. Um, Jim Veal and my uncle was Henry. Flash Power originally and they moved to Ardmore and then my dad married and my mother. She was a nurse here in Ardmore. And actually, the boat that he was fished down there, my father actually built it himself. Yeah, they were great times, actually, yeah. We made a number of calls to Tony Gallagher recently. He recalls our former neighbour in Curra, Nora Mulcahy, who grew up in Whiting Bay, overlooking the Keys. Tony also remembers other families who fished from the Keys in the past. Nora's mother died when she was young and that she was reared by her aunt, Mag Fitzgerald, over in where the car park is. From what I can gather, the, where the, the new car park, as we call it, in Whiting Bay, the houses that were there, we could see the stumps of them. The last time I saw them was probably about 10 years ago. They were laid bare by a storm. And there was four houses there. And that's where Mag Fitzgerald lived originally. And I think they might have been washed away with the tide or damage or something. So she moved over to the ivy clad houses, we'll call it now. But when Nora would meet people, she'd tell them that she lived in Paris. You know, that's it. because Paris was the field on the eastern side of those houses, just on, on the left hand side of the car park. That, that field was known as Paris of Paradise, you know. Then of Paddy Henry. No, they were you know when the Kenners and you went down to Goat Island. Yeah, you go around the bend there where where the um, the tune places where they're laid to rest. The next cottage on the right hand side, that was Bridgie and Paddy Hennebury's and Paddy Hennebury was a fisherman. And he's the only fisherman that I can establish. But there was Paddy Hennebury back I I can remember him as an old man. And he was always known as being a kind of a cute whore like you know, you'd ask him how many lobsters he got you. We got four and three of them are very small, like you know, so this kind of old folk out before radio and television, people made sort of characters out of the older generation, like, you know, and uh, Paddy, he, he was quite cute as well, because he'd have marked out the territory in the pots. He, he'd throw stones down with a rope and a boy attached to him, just to keep the fresh territory, and keep other fellas away, like, you know, but uh, Paddy and the Seamus Veal's father would have been the last person to keep a boat there seasonally during the summer for the salmon fishing. And 
ourselves, we yeah, we kept a boat down there as well back in the in the early sixties, like you know, we fished lobsters out of the jar. John had a Zoom call with Liam Sapale. Liam's book, The Personality of a Coastline, is comprehensive and concrete, covering the coastal place names from Ferry Point to Dungarvan. Hello, John. Hi, Liam. How are you? Very well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, same, thankfully. That's good, that's good. That's the way to have it. We're all growing beards, I noticed. Yeah, lockdown beard. <laughs> all part of the fun. The house here is divided on whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, I think it suits you. It does, yeah, it does, yeah. yeah. yeah as, as somebody said, it makes you look intelligent. <laughs> We need all the help we can get. <laughs> as we grew up, you know, they were known as the keys, and we all we always thought it was K E Y S. Yeah, yeah, See? yeah, yeah. Uh, and we noticed at times that there were boats moored there, you know, rowing boats. But of course, uh, you know, it, uh, it wasn't so. Uh, basically, you had what you had back there. Uh, up over on, on the land side was the Coast Guard ha- uh, watch house. Right. And right. Uh, the Coast Guard watch house, uh, you know, you had these watch houses like you have in 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 uh, the Coast Guard houses, like you have uh, over in Moon Tray and that you have down here in Helvey. Yes. In, in Whiting Bay, they, they, uh, and Mrs. Lincoln recorded this, that there was a room in one of the houses there. Right. In, up over the keys that was a watch room. Okay. And the Coast Guard had a view of the bay and what was going on in the bay, but they also had a view a- across the bay to the Coast Guard houses okay. in the tray. Okay. And again, they say that the, some of the houses there were built uh, as fishermen's houses yeah. in the past, and hence the keys where they could moor the boats, because if you look at it geographically, it's in a sheltered corner of Whiting Bay, and not exposed, shall we say, to to severe weather conditions, because it's trapped on three sides, if you like. Yes, okay. I like that now, because you're connecting the the, the mooring with the houses where they lived. So the story, in a way, is, is, is their homes, yeah. Yeah, they, you see the homes up over, and then they had, a, you see, there was no place else that you had moorings yes. that I'm aware of yes. along Whiting Bay, at this side anyway, at, at, at the eastern side of Whiting Bay. Okay, it's interesting on the map because there's two different types of geology coming out at that point. Um, there's, it, there's a mix of sandstone and of limestone, uh, okay. and uh, it, it's kind of complex there, and that might be how that channel formed for going out you you you've two other names there on the on your on your fabulous book you have Naspeaky, i guess you have Carigalady. yeah um, well Carigalady, as you look out uh, 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 with the speaky and look out to see on your uh, on your left hand side uh, the farthest out rock there is referred to as Carigalady. Right. now again uh, i think that i i found nothing uh, to give me uh, information as to how that came about. Okay. It would appear to be Carig, a scale get there now, and a lady, be the, uh, a boat called the Lady, yeah. or Lady something, yeah. got in trouble there, and that's how Carig a Lady. Yeah. Uh, and the speaky then, it would appear that it's the low uh, rocks there at the, uh, uh, at the right hand side as you look out. Yeah. That, there there's edgy rocks yes. down there, and that if you were in too close, there be uh, um, okay. Uh, there, there are spikes there that will will will, will, will damage your boat. Damage your boat. That's my interpretation of it. Okay. Neil Burke, a keen observer of birds, has spent time during lockdown recording the bird life in and around Ardmore. He provides some key insights into the role of farming and nature conservation. He also notes the place of our parish in a global ecosystem. So at this time of the year, what kind of birds will we expect to see down, down that end of Whiting Bay? Is, is it different to the whole of Whiting Bay? Or like, has that corner got its own uh, character in terms of birds? It, it, because that end tends, has the rocks right. and they, they are exposed uh, in the um, 
at uh, low tide, they generally hold the birds well, and you can see them easily. Right. Now, the, <clears throat> the difference between this winter and summer at Whiting Bay is like chalk and cheese. Well, chalk why? Cheese. Because a lot of the birds down there, and I have counted 17 waders that have been seen in Whiting Bay this winter, since yes. the 1st of September. I, you'll have big flocks of curlew. You can have large uh, flocks of oyster catchers, which don't catch oysters, of course. Um, curl uh, lapwing. Well, what, oh. what, do they, what do they eat? So well, they can, they can eat, you know, if you go along the beach and you see very, a lot of very big, wide holes in the sand, yeah. most of that is oyster catcher. Okay. And they're looking for invertebrates. So invertebrates is something that doesn't have a backbone, yeah. some, a worm or a, a squidgy thing, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, rag, rag worms, love worms, um, that type of thing that, that burrow in the sand. They're very good. They can also take some mollusks, you know, okay. amongst the rocks, rocks and things like that. Yeah. Okay. They uh, they can knock certain shells off the rocks, you know. Okay. At the East Car Park, East End Car Park. Every evening, there's a roost of about five hundred curlews, Eurasian right. curlews. There's right. about seven curlews in the world, but we have the Eurasian. Yeah. Curlew and seven five hundred. It is a magnificent sight to behold, and they're right. there all winter. But soon. Their numbers will dwindle and they yes. will disappear and they yeah. will head up to Fennel, Scandinavia, Russia, some Iceland, and they will breed there. Right. And we will end up in Ireland with about 120 breeding pairs. That's, that's 250 out of the perhaps 20, 30,000 curlew in the country at the moment. Okay. Because they they don't belong to us. They're only here on their winter holiday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we could um, have up to thirty thousand curlew in the country at the moment. Good, why right. five hundred of them in one field alone in Armour? Let me just let me just qualify the number the the curlew breeding. The attempts are are about 100, 120, but the success rate is abysmal. Is it? It, it is heading for breeding extinction. Right. Quickly, unless right. unless we do something amazing. But yes. It's heading that way. Down at the far end, the west end of Whiting Bay, there's a very big, beyond the forest, yeah. the, the middle car park, between that and moored, <clears throat> there's a huge open field. Yeah, right. No trees, just one or two wire fences. Somehow or other, the farmer is, is farming very friendly for birds. Right. Now, when, when you see, when you hear about ditches being taken out, and I heard a number today, 3,000 kilometres of ditches removed in Ireland, in the last three years, yes, you really get a fright. But sometimes, open countryside like down that down there is perfect for certain birds. Okay, and one of them is the hen harrier, and the okay. other is the merlin, and they're both down there. And I've seen them. I had a peregrine, a merlin, a hen harrier, and a buzzard on Saturday. <laughs> I had a kestrel, buzzard, hen harrier, merlin yesterday. Right. Come August, things start warming up. And okay. down, on the, down in Whiting Bay, you can start seeing the ringed plover, the sanderling, the dunlin coming back. These would be the, the more common small brown ones, as they call it. Yeah. Then we have the oyster catchers and the curlews coming back and the lapwing. Yeah. Bigger birds, more easy to see and observe. Yeah. But amongst them, Amongst those uh, birds coming in August and September, the big birders are always looking out for the rarities, the specialties. Yeah. And, and one, a couple of those that arrived this year on Whiting Bay were the curlew sandpiper, right. the little stint, and an extremely rare one. You'd expect that every year, but a really rare one was a pectoral sandpiper from America. The five poles are not a jetty, fish weir or a pier. John King's point that they are a navigation aid, a guiding line through a rock channel, is convincing. The poles were always used as a, when you're out at sea, once you have the poles lined up, you have safe passage right up to the high water mark. There were Welches there going back at least into the, the, the 1700s. 
and they seem to have lived always in that Goat Island out towards McKenna's Castle, or sorry, Ardogina House, that area. But my my grandmother and great-grandmother were born there. They, 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 my grandmother grew up in the Parnell House next door to Downey's. She would have been Bridget Welch. Welch would have been her maiden name, and Hunter was her married name. So David, David would have been the grand, my my great grandfather, and then Declan, Mary, uh, Kate would have been his children, and my grand uncles and aunts. Since since you m- moved to this idea, I've been talking to my mother, and she's been forthcoming with lots of stories that I hadn't heard before. She said they they did work very closely with each other out there. One of the, 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 the local traditions was after a storm, the men all went down to the beach with ropes and they measured out uh, the seaweed that had been washed in uh, and they communally scraped it up into piles and there was a, a, a stone code used. So uh, every family had uh, a code. So, for example, the Welches would have had three stones and they would have put the three stones on their mounds, and everybody knew there was a code of honour that was theirs. And that was used right up until relatively recently. People beach combing would make their little pile of timber or whatever they found on the beach at the high water mark and put their stones on it, and you you, you touch that at your peril. But my, my grand-aunt Mary would have been, I think, probably one of the last keeners. She describes going to... Uh, Keener, keening at a funeral, and there was a little boy drowned over in Carty's Cove at the far side of Whiting Bay, and she described him as being uh, small with cur- soft, curly blonde hair. What she used to do was write up a little, um, or produce a little recitation about his life in the old Irish. There was a clapping and dancing and keening around the laid out body and she describes that little that that little boy she was so upset about it that she didn't do it after that that was the last time she but she would have been probably the one of the last I, native irish speakers in our that would have been mary welsh and mary died in the late uh, mid mid 1960s around 1965 This video was made by John Tierney and Martha Hannan in response to a call for positive community actions from Ardmore Tidy Towns during the 2021 COVID-19 lockdown. We aim to do a number of these videos in the coming months and look forward to recording further stories of the place, its landscape, women and men. Thanks to the following for their assistance in making this video. Nikki Keating, John King, Liam Sapale, Tony Gallagher, Neil Burke and Jamie Veal. Special thanks to Mrs Kathleen King, whose birthday occurs about this time and whose memories, recounted by John, her son, reconnect us to different days in Arthur Gina and Whiting Bay. <laughs>